B visa process and the implications of the program and the applications of the program for the con construction industry specifically. This presentation is provided by the Mualam firm. Uh, our motto is navigate immigration and elevate business. So we really focus on business related solutions uh, related to immigration. Particularly, we talk, we uh, focus on temporary labor, investor options, self-sponsorship, and green cards for your workforce. Today, obviously, we're going to be talking about the H-2B visa program and what that is. So we'll go over some um, general information, eligibility, how the process works, some benefits and limitations of the program, who's the right fit for the program, as well as frequently asked questions, and also provide you with our contact information. Um, if you have questions throughout, feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, we'll have a section at the very end where we can address you know, any questions that come up. So the you know most pressing question, I think, is what is the H2B visa program? A lot of people have never heard of it or have heard a lot of you know misinformation about the program. And there's four key elements to remember here when we're talking about what the program is. First of all, it's a temporary non-agricultural work visa. Um, what that means is at the beginning of every position that we file for, there's an anticipated end date. And the work is non-agricultural. That means, you know, anything other than directly agricultural work qualifies for this. So sometimes I have people asking, you know, do I have to have a certain job or do I have to be in a certain industry? And the answer is no, it's very open as long as you're non-agricultural. The key here is showing that you're temporary and how to do that is typically one of two ways. You either show that you're seasonal or that you have a peak load need. And we'll go over what that means and which types of businesses qualify for that and what evidence is needed. And then the, the people that actually come here through the program have to be from eligible countries. That list changes every year, but probably the most notable for, for the countries that are available would be Mexico, and that's where the majority of workers come from. However, there are many countries that are aged to be eligible as well. And lastly, a labor certification is required. So this means that you need to prove that there are not eligible U.S. workers that are available and willing to take the job, and you have to go through certain steps in order to be qualified to accept H-2B workers. And obviously, we'll go through that process in just a moment as well. So in terms of eligibility, we talked about, you know, having a temporary need. And that's really one of three types. There's a fourth type that's very uncommon and frequently denied. So we're gonna focus on these three. And th the first one is being purely seasonal. And that's when a job is needed during only a specific time of the year. So think of snow cleaners in a place like Ohio. You know, there's obviously a season where they're needed and a season where they're not needed. This could be, you know, applied in many different fields. So sometimes, you know, concrete work, for example, can be seasonal. But the majority of construction companies actually fall under the second category, and that's peak load. So that means you have a baseline amount of workers that you need to operate, but there's certain in months of the year where that baseline is not enough and you because of fluctuations that you have you need to supplement that workforce with additional temporary labor and then the last time the last kind that that is you know used is a one-time occurrence and this is for really you know once in a lifetime projects and they could be up to three years um, one example would be, you know, if you're building a new airport in a city that never had an airport, that's unlikely to happen again in the history of a company. But let's say that you are a um, construction company that specializes in water treatment plants. Um, that's probably not a one time occurrence because you probably are going to build one or maintain one or fix one, you know, in a year or two. So the one time occurrence is reserved for special occasions. Peak load is the most common for construction and seasonal is for jobs that really have a true start date and end date every single year. For peak load and seasonal, the maximum a worker can be here under that particular position, and again, it's only for that position, is nine months. For a one-time occurrence, you have up to three years for that occurrence to, to occur, in, but it could obviously be shorter. How do we prove then that we are seasonal or that our work is temporary? Well, there's three main pieces of evidence that the Department of Labor looks at. And those are payroll records, monthly revenue reports, and their contracts and letters of intent. So our payroll is 
typically um, developed in a very specific way. So first of all, we limit it to only that position. So if you're asking for, you know, concrete laborers, for example, we're not going to include anybody that does framing. We're not going to include anybody that does plumbing. We're not going to include your office staff. It will just be for that position. We show how many hours, how many workers we have and their wages on a monthly period. And obviously, if you are seasonal, there's going to be a certain trend there. And we can say our seasonality is established by those payroll trends. The other uh, evident piece of evidence that's sometimes used is monthly revenue reports. So if you have orders placed in a way where you're billing as the work gets done, we can definitely also use your monthly revenue reports as proof. And you know, last but not least, contracts and letters of intent. So if we can show the Department of Labor, our, our clients, our customers, will only want our, the work performed during certain months of the year, then that works as well. Or if we can show that, you know, look, we have 10 contracts going on from April through December, but only one happening in the first quarter, that all shows, shows, sorry, shows seasonality. So we can be very creative in the arguments. And, you know, usually this is a conversation we have once you are interested in the H2B program, we'll go through all the evidence, but these are really what the government typically looks for and, you know, has um, established is, uh, is important for showing seasonality. The other ones are more um, anecdotal sometimes. So we show weather patterns, for example, as, as evidence. We show things like expert letters, um, advisory opinions by different boards. Sometimes we go to associations and ask them to write, you know, their opinion or what their understanding of seasonality is um, in that area. So for example, we could, you know, contact CEA and say, we have somebody who's, you know, wanting H2B workers. Can you write a summary from your experience as somebody who deals with a lot of companies and how, the seasonality is in, in, in the area. So definitely a lot, you know, of, of evidence available that we could use, but again, these are the three most primarily used. Um, so if you're interested in H2B, the thing to know is that there is a very specific timeline that we have to follow and that we go through three different government departments to get to the, the final approval. Those are the Department of Labor, USCIS, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, and lastly, the Department of State. So, you know, the 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 three departments work together in order to qualify workers to come to the United States. And in the next slide, we're going to discuss what each department does, as well as, you know, the burden that the employer has for each of these departments. So typically, you know, we want to start as soon as possible if you're thinking of getting workers. There are two times when visas are available, but depending on your need and what we have, technically the, the application process is open year round, but there's two times where the visas are, new visas are released, and that's April 1 and October 1. And actually October 1 is seen as the beginning of the year. So it's the beginning of the fiscal year. And then April 1 is the second half. We wanna start as soon as possible in reviewing your case and looking at the merits and discussing the obligations and making sure you fully understand the H2B program before you commit to it. Then around 150 days before the date of need, we want to submit a prevailing wage request. And what that is, basically, we provide information related to the job duties, experience, and location of the job. And based on that, the government will tell us what wage to pay. This is different if you're a union-covered company, and we'll talk about that as well. But generally speaking, the idea is, you know, we don't want to say that typically a construction laborer, let's say, gets paid $17 an hour. A company doesn't want to pay 17, they want to pay 12. So therefore, they're going to get somebody from another country where the cost of living is less and pay them 12. Well, the Department of Labor is trying to ensure that the U.S. workers are protected and we don't want to undercut their, their wages by being able to offer something less. So they make us file this prevailing wage in order to say that this is actually the minimum for that job in that area. So this is one, uh, occupation specific and two, location specific. So you'll see, you know, sometimes different MSAs will look different. So the same job in Cleveland, for example, could have a little bit higher wage than a job in Akron that does the same duties just because it's a different MSA. Um, 90 days before the date of need. So if we're thinking April 1, we'd want, we do this in the beginning of January, we actually will file the prepared temporary labor certification application. 
the attorney will write a statement of need and include your evidence. We also include a job order, which has all the basic requirements of the job. It's almost like a detailed job description. And we also include recruiter agreements because one of the things that we have to do is obviously recruit from the other country. And we want to make sure that our recruiter is respecting um, the rules and we make them sign agreement as well as a signed acknowledgement of the obligations from the employer that basically detail all the obligations you have as an H2B employer. We um, then will submit the application and a lottery will happen if we're talking April. So the lottery is computer generated. It's 100% without human intervention. So the computer program will decide each position, what, you know, what group it's in. And it's an alphabetical uh, determination. So you'll be placed all the way from group A to sometimes G or H, depending on how many applications were filed that year. And then the Department of Labor will start processing the applications in alphabetical order. So obviously the goal is to be in group A because you're going to be processed first, but um, there are solutions for other groups, which we'll talk about as well. Um, if you're a first time company, it's very common to get a notice of deficiency, meaning that you will get a question that will say, you know, we have concerns or discrepancies and these discrepancies have to be addressed or the concerns have to be addressed. So maybe we didn't prove your seasonality with beyond, you know, the standard of, um, you know, the DOL, or maybe, you know, there's a error that's in the application where the wage is, you know, 20 cents off, for example. So the, this gives us an opportunity to cure any defects in the application. Typically after that, if everything goes well, then we're going to get the notice of acceptance. And at this point, you have basically met the regulatory, regulatory requirements. The DOL has said, yes, you are seasonal, you've justified the number of workers you want, and you're a company that can qualify for H2B, but we're still going to ask you to recruit U.S. workers. And that's done in a very specific way. We have to post it at the state workforce agency and at the physical job site, and then we report the results back to the DOL. I'll tell you, as somebody who's done this very, very frequently, um, you know, I've done about 600 applications a year for three and a half, four years. Um, we've only had two situations where we had to reduce the number of workers because of this process. So typically people that are, you know, engaging in H2B already have tried everything and it hasn't worked. So it's not typically a job that is going to get a lot of traction, but we do have to go through and interview all U.S. workers. And then at that point, we file with USCIS if the cap is open. So that means if there's still visas available, then we move on to the Department of Homeland Security. And if, you know, obviously the application at that point is approved, which typically it is within 15 days with premium processing, then we uh, will process the workers. And at that point, the focus of the process shifts from the company to the workers. And they'll look and see, you know, are the workers that are um, being selected, are they safe to enter the country? Do they have any negative immigration history? Is there anything preventing us from having these individuals enter the United States? The visa is typically issued within three days, and then we complete check-in once they get here. Once you get to that check-in process, it's almost identical to having a U.S. worker in terms of how you treat them and your obligations. We'll talk about some of the minor differences, but generally speaking, you know, H-2B workers aren't treated much differently than any other worker once you get past the stage. Um, is it Natalie? Natalie, yes. Natalie, um, I do have a question. Can I just interject periodically? Please. Okay, thank you. So this is going back to the beginning of your slide. Um, you had mentioned uh, you had three columns up. One was payroll and one was revenue, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, so for a new company, obviously, there's no established payroll within this program. Um, I, you know, I have workers, but would I just show their payroll? Of exactly. those, you know, that. OK. Yes. And. Um, OK, I, I think I, I took notes on some other things. I think I'm OK. OK, yeah, sure. Yes. That. But so how that looks like for payroll, if you're a first time filer, is we will divide the payroll into different categories. So we'll have our permanent workforce, you know, somebody who you've had over the last 12 mm. months, then somebody who maybe you hired on a seasonal basis, even if they're a U.S. Okay. worker, they'll be in a different category. And then if you have anybody that's part time, 
we'll have them in a third category. And for each of those, by month, we'll have the hours worked, the number of workers, and the earned wages. So they don't, you know, want to see everybody's name or anything like that. They just want to mm -hmm. see you maybe have like 10 permanent workers, two um, uh, part-time workers, and let's say two workers that are um, seasonal, that you've hired seasonally full-time. And for each one, we'll, we can graph and say, you know, maybe the number of workers hasn't changed. You've had 10 workers throughout the season, but there's certain months where you're giving them more overtime, or there's certain months where they're getting paid more because of the, the overtime structure. So really, as long as there's a general pattern, then you're okay. And then in the subsequent years, we're able to show the payroll, including the H2B workers, which makes right. your case stronger. Um, once you are approved, though, and I didn't mention this before, but once you are approved for H2B, you are registered for three years. So that means you don't have to keep proving your seasonality for those three-year periods, so long as the number of workers hasn't significantly changed. Thank you. Of course. So the the question that comes up then is, you know, I have a union. Can I still do H2B? And what's the effect of, you know, having a union presence on being able to process H2B? As long as you are not negatively impacting the union workers by introducing H2B workers, it is perfectly fine to have both exist together. And I'll say, you know, my previous practice, about 15 to 20% of our cases were actually union covered. So it's it's common. It's not obviously the, the majority of the situation because most companies don't have a union presence. But for those that do, you know, you don't have to rule yourself out of this option just because a union exists. There are additional requirements that are added because of your union presence but they're very manageable if your union is willing to work with you. And those are, first of all, getting a letter from the union that agrees with your analysis of what category the job would fall into and the wage rate it would fall into. And then the company would write an identical letter saying, yes, like we think this is the appropriate category and this is the appropriate wage rate. And as long as those two match and there's an agreement, then that's what your prevailing wage will be. So we talked earlier how there's a survey and that's how they base you know, the prevailing wage as, and it depends on area as well as the job description. But the CBA will override that. So if you have a union and the jobs, you know, obviously the job and, and the wages are already established, the Department of Labor will honor that. But they want to see that you're actually putting them in the right category. And if both the union rep and the company agree, then the DOL is just basically going to issue that determination to mirror that. There's also a requirement that the H-2B workers that come in become union members. So if there is union dues that are, you know, obviously um, uh, allocated for that, then you can deduct that from their wages directly and make that a requirement of them accepting the job. So let's say the union dues are $100 every two weeks. You can make that deduction directly from the payroll and provide it to the union. So a lot of times, you know, when you present this to a union, um, you're really just getting them new members. You're not, um, you're, it's not like you're no longer using union members. You're just getting a new source for union members. And then when we recruit US workers, if you recall after your notice of acceptance, one of the requirements that's added is that you do have to notify your union rep of the, um, the process and that you've gotten approved and therefore you're recruiting. And they can provide you with some workers, you know, in the in the process as well. Um, most times that doesn't happen because if your union had enough workers and and were providing you with enough workers, you probably would not turn to H2B. But if that's the case, then they do get that opportunity again at that point to provide you with workers. So what are the benefits of H2B? Like why even do this? It's obviously a process that requires more work than than you know just hiring locally and you know has additional cost to it of course as well so why do this and really there are three key reasons the first one is just access to temporary labor most companies have tried it all and have basically said we cannot find qualified candidates in our area that are willing to do the work so this is just a new pool of labor that exists outside of your immediate circle or your immediate um 
uh, recruitment practices that you're able to now access. So it's giving you an untapped source that you're able to dive into and get high quality workers. And that's really the second point is that when you recruit through H2B, you can be very selective. And, you know, this is obviously anecdotal, but most companies that I've worked with have said that the H2B workers are a higher caliber of worker than what they're able to find locally. Um, most of the time, because there's a different emphasis in different cultures on, on this type of work, um, also you can be selective in how much experience you're requiring, um, what types of skills you're requiring, and obviously, you know, most of the time H2B is a substitute for temp agencies. So when it comes to that, you know, most U.S. workers, if they want a job, they can go and, and find one in these industries. And people at temp agencies, they probably, you know, don't want to do this long term. So you're getting that replacement by someone who does want this as a career and who does have um, experience in, in the field as well. And then lastly, it provides economic efficiency. And I think, you know, a lot of times people talk about the cost of H2B and obviously there's a cost to it. But the, on the other side, we have the cost of vacancy, which, you know, obviously you have unfilled uh, positions, unfilled orders, unfilled work, but the cost of also recruiting for those positions, the cost of training, the cost of retraining, the cost of amping up to get to that highest productivity level, all minimize when you utilize a program like this, because you, you get a workforce that's, you know, efficient and you only hire when you need it. So there's no expectation of keeping people busy year round because the maximum you can have somebody here is nine months. And during those nine months, then, you know, you, it's probably the nine months that you are the most busy and won't have trouble keeping them, um, you know, um, with a full schedule the entire time. Um, Natalie, I had a really quick question. So as far as I've worked with H1B visa status before versus H2, T, sorry, lose my mind here, H2B. Um, I guess what's the biggest difference? Because I know that with H1B, it was like a three-year status um, versus this. And do they have to use like a third party? Is, do they have like a, um, I guess, an employer that you have to work through in order to get these, you know, get get these candidates or I guess how does that recruiting process kind of look like for H2B? Sure, of course. So first of all, H1B is for specialized occupations. So most of the time when we're talking H1B, it's people with at least a bachelor's degree and then a specific set of experience that qualifies them for the job. With H2B, it's more focused on labor level positions. So you can require no experience or you can require a lot of experience. You could require ex um, skills that are related to like manual dexterity, for example, not necessarily, you know, college education. So that's the biggest difference. Um, with H1B, like you said, it's three years and renewable for another three years. So a maximum of six years. H2B, you have a maximum of nine months, but the same worker can come back almost indefinitely. So you definitely have the option of having the workers return. And most companies do obviously want to do that because you have the training that you've invested into, into the program. So you really end up with um, the same workers over and over again. So I had some companies that I worked with that have had the same workers for 15, 20 years, unlike the H-1B where there's a limit to it. But I think really the key difference is just different jobs qualify for it. You can't really have, um, you know, a concrete laborer, for example, qualify for H-1B. And then when it comes to the source of the workers, so there is no one source that you can use. Some companies will use um, word of mouth referrals. So let's say they have somebody from a foreign country already working for them and they'll ask them, you know, do you have um, friends or family that you think would be interested in working here? And that's how they get the names and we process them. Other companies will use a recruiter. So with those recruiters, there are usually people that are in that foreign country. Um, we have uh, some relationships at my firm with other foreign recruiters. And, you know, we can make you some recommendations if that's what you want to do. But also there's some agencies that exist that are um, more government agencies in other countries that also are a source of labor. So there's not really one source. You could do it yourself. You could send somebody over to look. You could um, hire a recruiter to do the you know the, the search for you. Or you can throw, go through one of the government agencies available in the other country in order to get a list of workers and, and contact them that way. 
but it's definitely not like centralized, like the J-1 visa program, for example. There's a sponsor who then brings the people to the United States or qualifies them for the position. And then companies that want to use the, the, you know, the, the workers have to take from that sponsor. That's not really like the H2B. You can be very selective in who you bring over from overseas and you can do it in a very grassroots way if that's available to you. Okay, thank you. No problem. I hope that answered your question. So, of course, you know, the program isn't perfect. Um, there are certain limitations to it. The first one, and I think probably the most critical one, is the fact that there's a limit on the number of visas. So there's only 66,000 visas that are issued annually, and they're split into two categories. The first one is October 1, and the second one is April uh, 1st. So those 66,000 are typically not enough. And because of that, there's a limitation on the number of visas. And that's why we have the lottery. And that's why, you know, sometimes we need to be very creative in our solutions for H2B. The second limitation is that the process itself, as you probably saw earlier, is pretty complex. And there's a lot of different agencies you're dealing with and very strict timelines. So it does require professional help. It's not really something that most companies can do on their own or do in-house without having outside counsel. And then lastly is the program is only for temporary seasonal or peak load need. So, you know, even if you have a shortage, um, this program is not really a good fit for you unless you have some seasonal restrictions and, you know, on, on the work being done. Otherwise, you are um, basically told by the government that you need to file for a green card. The problem with that is the green card process takes three to four years, unlike this, which takes six months. Plus, you know, once you get the worker here, they can really go anywhere. They're just like any other U.S. worker. So it doesn't really have that protection that the H2B program has. I think the green card program is an amazing solution for people who know their workers closely, but I would never suggest it for somebody who's just, you know, meeting people that are overseas, don't know anything about their work ethic, and then you sponsor them and it takes you three, four years to get them here. And then who knows how, how things go. So it's definitely more of a program that's, you know, that's a good fit for people who maybe have done H2B for a few years and really know the workers well. But unless you are seasonal, then H2B is not really a good option for you. So what happens if the cap is filled? Does that mean you're completely out of luck? In most circumstances, no. Um, there are some solutions that we can, you know, kind of use or some strategies we can use in order to help you. The first one is getting cap exempt workers. And what that means is the way that the cap works is they count the, the number of visas issued in a year, not necessarily the positions in the United States that are filled in a year. So one way to think about it is, you know, first of all, the, the, the fiscal year begins October 1 and it ends September 30th. So as long as a worker enters in October, um, they are exempt for that entire year for any job that begins before September 30th of the next year. So let's say you have a job in April. What you could do is if the cap is filled, you could find somebody who's been here the previous October. It could be your own worker if you've had a fall visa, or it could be somebody else's worker. Let's say you bring somebody who was here for winter work or somebody that was doing construction down in Florida where, you know, that's their peak load. Um, you would bring somebody that was here from October through the April um, under the visa, and then they would be exempt for from for that April one filing. So you're kind of borrowing from the first half of the year to bring to the second half of the year, and that person is exempt. The second possible option is a supplemental cap. So what that is, it's like a bonus round. Sometimes the government, depending on you know the politics at the time and the the labor market at the time, they'll take a look and they'll say, you know, the 66,000 visas was just simply not enough. So we're going to issue more visas and we're going to do it in a specific way that adds more restrictions, but those visas are still available. So a lot of times that's what happens. And, you know, the government will take a look and they'll say, we're going to add, let's say, 20,000 for people from the Northern Triangle countries, which are El Salvador, Hon Honduras, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. And then we're going to have an additional, um, 
usually it's around 40,000 visas for people from every other country so long as they're, they've been in the United States within the last three years on an H-2B visa. So if that happens, that obviously opens up a whole new avenue of for you to get workers. And then the last possible method is in-country transfers. So that means we could work on a partnership between you and another company that has an opposite season. So once they're done with their workers, we can transfer them to you or vice versa. And that becomes very helpful. Um, the, the companies could be, you know, side by side and they could be like, let's say both companies are in Cleveland. One of them has a job April through June. The second one has a job from July through September. We could just do an in-country transfer from the first company to the second in order to help them you know, navigate the cap. We can also have completely opposite seasons where somebody is working you know, winters in Florida and summers in Cleveland, for example. Or sometimes the workers unilaterally on their own will just start at a company and just not enjoy the work and they'll look for a different job. So we have a source for recruiting from within the United States for people that are looking for a job that are already on H2B for that year. And because they've been counted, we don't need to worry about them counting again. So that's where really the, the creativity comes in and you know being flexible because there are typically options to get workers, even if you're capped out, but you have to be flexible and, you know, open to, to these options. And, you know, if you are, then they typically work. Um, one thing I always, always, always talk about during, um, you know, any initial consultation I have with a client is don't expect too much of the program in your first season of applying. The first season is going to be the one where you're going to be tested the most, where the DOL is going to have the most scrutiny over your application, where you have no history of, of getting approved that you can fall back on, where you don't have cap exempt workers, where you don't have returning workers. So the first season really that you do this, it's not typically going to go perfectly. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're riding a bike and then you get the training wheels, you know, kind of added and, and you get more flexibility, I'm sorry, more stability as you go on. So I always tell companies, you know, if, if you've tried this and it doesn't work perfectly the first time, it doesn't mean the H2B program is a bad fit for you. It just could take another try. And it's those companies that really do try again after, you know, maybe having some mishaps the first season or, or a late start or something like that they are typically the ones that end up with great results because over time what happens is you gain more and more and more advantages. So somebody who's done this for two, three years is at more of an advantage than somebody who's starting out because they have all these things in their arsenal. And over time, we can build those things together. And sometimes it doesn't take years. It takes, you know, two seasons in a year, for example, to, to build up that arsenal. So just be very patient with it. And it's not a last ditch effort of like, you know, I have a project starting April 1 and if I don't get H2B workers, all is, you know, going to break loose and I'm going to lose, you know, big, you know, big chunk of my company. That's not when to use H2Bs. When to use H2Bs is more long-term thinking, like how do I scale up? How do I you know, ensure my projects are getting done timely? Um, it's at a time where your company is healthy culture-wise, and that's where you introduce H2Bs. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, I think it's a great, great program, but we have to also use it in a way that is, um, you know, added advantageous and takes look at the the long term uh, projection of it, not just what can it do for me in the next six months, but how can I use this to grow my business over the next few years? So who's really the right fit for age to be? There's three main things. You know, the first one is, are you seasonal? Second one, do you have good records and the ability to keep good records after? And third of all, do you have enough work to be able to invest in labor? And if all three of those are a yes, then you are probably a good fit. Um, what that looks like for each company is obviously a little bit different, but typically those are the three major things we look out for. And then, you know, everybody wants to know what are my obligations as an H2B employer? The first obligation starts before you even, you know, get anybody here, and that's recruitment. So we want to make sure when we recruit outside the United States that the recruiter we're using is someone who's not taking advantage of the workers. We have to make them sign an agreement saying that they're not charging the workers to come, that they are not, um, you know, selecting workers based off personal favors or anything like that. 
And then obviously we want to make sure that there's somebody that doesn't have, um, you know, any documented issues of, of previous misdealings with uh, foreign workers. Um, our firm would definitely help you with that. And we deal with people that are very reputable. Um, and then the second category comes to related to travel and daily sustenance. So this only applies, and I have to really emphasize this because sometimes it's like jarring for companies, but this only applies from the time they leave their home city to the time they get to the work site. And then from the time after the contract is over that they leave the work site to the home city, you are responsible for travel. And that is the most economic travel available. So if we're talking Mexico, it's typically Greyhound ticket. Um, Sometimes it's a passenger van, sometimes it's cheap airfare, but it does require you to pay for them to get there. And then also a daily sustenance amount. So that is right now, I believe at a minimum of $16 a day and a maximum of $59 a day. And that is only again, from the time they leave their city to the time they get to the work site and back. This does not include every day that they're in the United States. This is just the time that they're traveling to get to you. The other obligation is that you pay overtime wages and overtime, sorry, prevailing wages and overtime as, you know, specified in the job order. And lastly, you have an obligation that is um, to help them get a social security card the first time that they're here. What that looks like is you have to help them find the form online if they don't know how to get to it. And our firm will help with that as well if, you know, obviously if we're working together and to keep records. So that means you have to keep the payroll records and you have to keep um, their, their visa records for a certain period of time after you utilize the program. Um, again, the attorney's office will typically help you with this, but it's important for you to also have a designated space where you keep all this information in case of a, a random audit happening or you know something happening in the future where those records are needed. Other than this, you do really treat the H2B workers just like any other worker. We get questions all the time about, you know, do I deduct from their taxes for, you know, for federal taxes and state taxes? The answer is yes. Um, am I responsible for everything that they do out in the world? The answer to that is no, just like any other worker. So you really do treat them very similar to your other workers once we get past the travel and getting them settled here. Um, but the key obligations are more, you know, following the rules that you've set for yourself in the job order. So if you've, if you're saying, you know, I'm going to um, provide you with a per diem, for example, then you better do that. Or if you say I'm deducting a certain amount for, for union dues, then you better do that. So it's really the contract that you've created that you have an obligation to follow. Outside of that, the obligations are very simple as, as everybody, you know, obviously can, can see here. Um, I'm going to, you know, open up some time for questions. If nobody has questions, we can also go some over some frequently asked questions that are typically, you know, on everybody's mind as they're pursuing H2B. And I also wanted to provide everybody with my contact information in case you're thinking about pursuing the program, or if you have more detailed questions that you'd like to ask as well. Um, Natalie, this is Ronnie again. Uh, <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, so I had to click off. I don't know if you mentioned anything about uh, housing. Um, we assist with their housing here, or how does that look? Sure. So housing is not an obligation for age to be employers. However, it really does help when it comes to recruitment. So if you're looking for somebody from another country and you tell them housing is available, then they're more likely to take the job, right? Because they don't really live here. They don't speak the language. They don't have connections. So there's always going to be that fear of what do I have to pay for for housing? However, the nice thing about H2B is you can deduct that cost of housing. So let's say that house is costing you, I'm just making up a number here, obviously, $1,000. And you can have, it's a two bedroom duplex and you can have four people in that house. So it's costing 250 a month. Um, you can deduct that 250 per, per person from their paycheck. So you would take out 125 per paycheck if they're getting paid bi-weekly. So it's a recouped cost that you would have. 
Um, and it's a cost that you can definitely control. But the idea here is you're providing them with at least some way to estimate their cost of living in the United States. And that really, really goes a long way with recruitment, but it's not an obligation. A lot of times people get this confused because H2A, which is for the uh, farm workers, that does require housing. And there's inspections done on the housing and has to meet very specific standards. Okay. And I, I have two more questions. Yes, please. Um, now, understandably, there probably may possibly be, is a language barrier. Um, is there any assistance in ways to address that? Sure. So there's really three ways to do that. The first one is sometimes companies will hire someone in the United States that speaks Spanish. And then that person will be the, the point of contact between the workers and the company. The second way is to hire somebody in that foreign country that speaks English. So it really depends on you know where we're looking. In Mexico, for example, it's a little bit harder to find laborers with English uh, proficiency than it would be in Costa Rica, for example, where it's introduced in middle school. So almost everybody in Costa Rica speaks English, um, you know, regardless of their education level. Um, in Mexico, it's a lot harder. So that's also a possibility. So we could you know look for somebody either from an English speaking country, or we could have one person amongst the group that speaks English that's going to be your immediate. And then some companies have used um, certain programs. So there's a software program, for example, that I've run into recently called Team Engine. And they have um, AI technology that translates in real time. And you could also, you know, use that type of resource as well to, to go around the language barrier. So, and, and, you know, for that app, for example, anything that you put in there automatically gets translated with AI and it gets sent to that person as a text message or a WhatsApp message. And it has all the full translation in there you know, with all the context clues that AI picks up on. So there's definitely a lot of, of tools out there. You could use Google Translate. You could use a lot of different things. But if language is very, very important, then we would limit our search to the English-speaking countries. Okay. And then my last question, it may, I, I mean, I, I think you offered an offline conversation. Uh, I think I, th I think I would like to explain what I'm trying to do to see if this would be a good program. And um, so it may be offline. Is that possible? Yes, it is. So my contact okay. information is on the screen. If you'd like to go to my website, there's a um, consultation link. You could fill that out and I could definitely reach back to you. Or if you'd like to shoot me an email or, or a call, those uh, that information is up there as well. Okay. And then I don't know if you indicated anything about the price. How much does something like this typically cost? Sure. So we can definitely talk about pricing. Um, the way that pricing is set up is you have to remember there's three different steps that we go through. So, you know, there's there's the step that happens at the Department of Labor. And then there's the step at the Department of Homeland Security. And then there's the step at the Department of State. So the Department of Labor is actually completely free. They do not charge anything for them to process your application and issue the labor certification. And there's no additional cost that you have to incur because of that. However, that's the most labor intensive part of the process. And that's where the attorney's fees come in. So, you know, obviously when we talk, I can give you a quote of my pricing um, and you can get an idea of, of what I charge. I typically charge one flat rate per petition, regardless of how many workers you bring in, and then a smaller rate per worker. And then the second part of the application goes to USCIS, and that's where you're going to be charged. So the government will issue a charge depending on your company size. If you have 25 or more full-time employees, that cost is about $3,000. And that's, again, per petition. So even if you're asking for 10 workers, you're not paying that 10 times. You're paying that one time, um, so long as they're all the same position. Um, if you're less than 25, it's about... $2,600. So it, it's a little bit of a difference, but the idea is they charge you less depending on your company size. And then the last part of the process, which is the Department of State, um, that is $205 currently per person. And that's really for them to do a background check on that individual. So if you have, you know, 10 people, you are paying that 10 times because each person needs a background check and an interview. And that's how much the cost is assessed at. So it's the 205 per position. So you have attorney's fees, which obviously, you know, are different, but then 
for the position itself, the bulk is the $3,000 if you're 25 or more, and then 205 per person for the Department of State. So overall, most companies will say that it's very um, cost effective if you're bringing on four or more people compared to a temp agency where you're paying at least a 20% premium per hour. So once you get these workers, you're just paying them the prevailing wage, you don't pay a premium on their wages. Okay, thank you. Of course. Any more questions? All right. So um, I think the I have a few more, you know, frequently asked questions we can go over. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, the question that I also get asked pretty frequently is the driver's license. So, you know, if I have a worker here, how do they get to work every day? Can they drive? How does that work? So the answer is yes, they can get a driver's license. And that driver's license is very much, um, you know, uh, like it's it's just like any other driver's license. So they can use it however, they, you know, they need to. So if you'd like to give them a company car, for example, and have a designated driver every day, that's a possibility. Um, you could have a US uh, driver that takes them to work every day, but it is good that they are able to get a driver's license. And then I think we touched upon this before, but how do I actually find workers? And again, we would help you uh, find a recruiter that's reputable in whatever country that you're interested in recruiting from, and they would help you set up that recruitment and, you know, obviously go from, go from there depending on what your needs are. All right, I think that really concludes all the, the questions I had um, you know, prepared for, but if anybody again has any questions, feel free to ask or reach out to me privately. Um, my number is 216-312-4700. I can also be reached via email at nataliemualem at mualemfirm.com, or you can go to my website, mualemfirm.com, and there's a free consultation button, which will take you straight to the contact us page, and you can leave a message and we'll get back in touch with you to schedule an appointment as well. Um, if anybody's interested in filing for April, the best time to do that is now because we would have to have your prevailing wages in the first half of November. Um, otherwise, if you're interested for the October filing, that will uh, begin in April of this year, preparing for a July file date. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time. And I hope uh, you found this informative. And please uh, feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you.